So welcome everybody. We've still got uh, a minute before the official start time, according to my clock. And uh, then we usually give it uh, about two minutes for people to continue to roll in. Again, welcome everybody. It's our official start time, but I keep hearing beeps of people joining in, so we'll give it another two minutes. So again, welcome everybody. We've, uh, we've still got people joining in, so I'll give it another minute. But again, welcome. Today's topic is ADSS accessories. Okay, I haven't heard a beep for a while, so I think we'll go ahead and get started. So, and then there's beep, <laughs> Murphy's Law. Welcome everybody. I'm Mike Riddle and today's topic is ADSS accessories. And it's two past the hour, so we'll go ahead and get started. So let's hit it. So first of all, uh, this presentation is RCEP compliant. Uh, this just means that we've met their standards and requirements for the registered continuing education program. And you can get credit, we'll tell you how later in the presentation. Uh, you basically have to go to a place, take a little test, and then you would get the credit issued through rcep.net. Uh, the fact that we meet their standards does not mean that in any way they uh, endorse or approve of the content of this webinar. So the purpose and learning objectives. So today we're going to be talking about ADSS accessories. And so our specific objectives would be to understand the two basic ADSS dead end types and why one of them is generally preferred over the other. And along the way, we're going to talk about tension coupling and the classifications for dead ends. Uh, for ADSS, this is really, really important. Uh, we're also going to talk about the two basic types of ADSS suspensions and supports and talk about the advantages and disadvantages of each. We'll talk about the type of vibration damper you can use on ADSS and why. Uh, we're going to look at the three basic types of splice enclosures, just very briefly, and then some other items that you might need for your project. So we've already done our introduction and reviewed the learning objectives. Next up is the actual presentation, and we will have a Q&A session afterwards, but please make uh, limit questions to technical questions on this topic, please. And let's get going. Kidoki. So uh, for those of you that have attended my ADSS engineering, cable engineering 101 seminar, you know that there is a wide range of designs for ADSS cables. You've got a uh, single jacket versus double jacket. You've got different types of polyethylenes. You can use Kevlar or better known, excuse me, uh, also known as Aramid or fiberglass for the strength. You can have dry tubes or flooded tubes and a dry core or a flooded core. 
and you've got your fiber count and et cetera, et cetera. So lots of different things uh, to think about. But the accessory side, it, it's a little bit more straightforward. Uh, it, but I do want to note that uh, the accessories that you use on your ADSS cable need to be specifically designed for use on ADSS. So you can't just use something that you might have used on another type of cable. And I will note that generally ADSS accessories, so this is a very rough rule of thumb, the lead time has been stock to about eight weeks, but uh, there has been a lot of craziness over the last couple of years. Um, I've used a lot of pictures that I found here. I've tried to give uh, thank yous for those um, that where I could identify the specific manufacturer. And for the others, I just offer my apologies if I didn't give them a, um, uh, you know, and offer appreciation. Uh, I'm going to give a check mark to items that I like. This is the much coveted Mike likes rating. Um, if you have a Mike's right, Mike likes rating, and about ten bucks now, you can get a cup of coffee at Starbucks. So pictorially, this just gives us an overview of the accessories that you're going to use with your ADSS cable. So over here, you see a dead end. In a high electric field, you might have a corona coil on it, an SVD type damper. You've got a, uh, this, this is supposed to represent the suspension. Over here, you've got a support. You might use airflow, airflow spoilers if you've got galloping as a problem. Um, this snowshoe type uh, storage system. A splice enclosure, one over here, one over here, down lead clamps, ab abrasion protectors. We'll talk not about every single item on this uh, schematic, but we'll talk about most of them. So this is just the same thing in a list version. And let's just keep going. So first up, dead ends. You've got two types of dead ends. The first is this formed wire type. It's basically a guy grip. But with ADSS, what you do is first you have a layer of structural reinforcing rods. So basically a set of armor rods that are applied over the cable. And then you're applying the dead end body over top of that. For uh, the, the light use ones, maybe you don't have the reinforcing um, layer on them. but the basic concept is like this. And note that you have a thimble. That's to keep the um, like the opening or the eye of the dead end from uh, collapsing when the uh, when the cable is under tension. And this is a good point to introduce this concept of coupling zone. Fundamentally, what's going on with a dead end on any kind of cable is that you have to get the tension in the cable coupled to the dead end, which in turn is coupled, meaning connected to your structure. So the distance where you get the transition from the tension in the cable to the dead end itself is what's called the coupling zone. In general, you would like the coupling zone to be as long as possible. But of course, in the real world, you end up making trade-offs, right? Because uh, obviously, a coupling zone of a mile would not work, not be practical at all. Um, so you, you end up with a trade-off balancing the coupling zone with other factors, such as ease of installation, ease of installation and uh, in my uh, bizarre example, uh, practicality would be another trade-off. The general advantages of formed wire dead ends are that they're very inexpensive. They have excellent availability. And compared to the other type we're going to talk about in a minute, they have uh, the best tension coupling. So they have a good long coupling zone, which is especially when you're a cable designer like me, you like a good long coupling zone. You want the dead end to be gentle on your cable. 
But the disadvantage is that good long coupling zone can get to a point where uh, it causes problems, right? If it's over eight feet, and it can be on some very strong long span type ADSS cables, especially if there's a tracking resistant jacket, uh, an eight foot long dead end becomes a pain in the tush to get installed, and you may not be able to install it from a pole, which may mean you need a bucket truck to do it or some other equipment. So that length uh, becomes a, uh, a factor in making the installation harder, and that means it takes more time. Oh, but I failed to notice, you know, it does get the coveted Mike Likes Award. The other type of dead end to use, I really strongly discourage it. And that's what's commonly called a wedge type dead end. And you see an example of that here. Uh, these are uh, inexpensive and they're easy and slash fast to install, uh, but they have some significant disadvantages. There's no rods to protect the cable. You have a very short coupling zone, so over, here, you had a coupling zone on the order of feet, you know, from a couple feet to maybe four feet, sometimes longer. Here, you have a coupling zone that's measured in inches or centimeters, if you prefer. And moreover, in the real world, this type of dead end, the way it works, you end up with a stress concentration at the mouth. Here, you don't have exactly uh, evenly distributed uh, coupling, but it tends to be concentrated more towards the end. So you've worked your way up as you went along the body of the dead end. Here, you're doing it the opposite. You end up with a lot of stress here and not as much here. And that leads to problems. The problems are slippage because you don't develop full holding strength but this stress concentration makes you much more vulnerable to jacket tears. Uh, pictures of jacket tears from the field. Now, this does not mean that it was 100% the, the dead end's fault. Uh, but if I had to bet, that's the way I would be betting. I mean, you would have to know more about the cable design uh, and the dead end itself to uh, to know that, but um, that's the way I would bet. I can just say it that way. I do note, I never noticed this before on this particular picture. Notice how this wedge has opened up at the end. So I don't know if that's the way it was originally or if that somehow is related to the jacket tear, but it's really interesting to me because this is the opposite of what I just told you. I would expect a stress concentration at the mouth, which means I would expect it to be narrower or more focused in on the cable here than at the back. But in this particular picture, it's actually the opposite. So interesting, never noticed that before. So bottom line, sorry, I suggest you avoid this type. My, my opinion for what it's worth. So, those formed wire dead ends have ratings, and it's necessary that you understand how the ratings work in order to select the proper dead end for your application. Those, uh, I say five ratings, and then there's one, two, three, four here. Interesting. I think this was supposed to be a four. Let's check ahead. So this is a mistake. So you've got light, limited, medium, and high. When I did this, I might have had in mind that track resistant jackets was its own category in my defense, but I don't think that's necessary. So this should be a four. So light, sometimes called uh, cutesy, L-I-T-E, or even mini, the limited tension, medium tension, and high tension. So how do you select them? Well, every cable has a maximum rated design tension. Every fiber optic cable specifically has a maximum rated design tension. 
In ADSS, this is actually very commonly called maximum rated cable load or MRCL. They mean the same thing. So this is the tension that the cable should never exceed in operation under any condition, ice, wind, what have you. The, the tension should never go above that. So you have to match the, the cables maximum rated design tension or MRCL against the dead ends maximum loaded tension. So apparently the uh, cable manufacturers and the dead end manufacturers couldn't get together and agree on one term. <laughs> so this is the maximum tension that the dead end will hold. So the two need to be coordinated with one another. We'll see why in just a minute. And then plus you've got to match the OD with the range of the dead end. Now, before moving on, I wanna mention that if a cable has a track resistant jacket, then you have to work with both the dead end manufacturer and the cable supplier. Otherwise you are risking both problems and finger pointing, meaning the cable supplier saying, it's not our wonderful cable, it's that lousy dead end that you're using and the dead end supplier saying, it's not our wonderful dead end, it's the lousy cable that you're using. Uh, in addition uh, for this, the tracking resistant material is an issue, but usually when you're using a track resistant jacket or when you need a track resistant jacket, your spans are longer, which means it's a more challenging uh, situation. Uh, but as I say, the, the jacket material also means be careful. So. So the light dead ends you can use if all of the following apply. So that cable MRDT or MRCL less than 800 pounds or 3.5 kilonewtons. So for our international customers, I'm not gonna keep spelling them out, but you'll see them on the slides. Spans are less than 300 feet. You've got a standard polyethylene outer jacket, which could be low density, medium density, or high density polyethylene. So any of these are okay. Um, and the span is not a critical span. So if it's going over a highway or a river or anything that's important to you, you should upgrade to the next higher class, which would be a limited. So again, in a similar way with the limited, all of the following need to apply. The uh, MRDT less than 2,500 pounds, the spans less than 600 feet, medium density or high density polyethylene only. So I've dropped low density polyethylene. I am not a fan of low density polyethylene for an outer jacket. I, in fact, I think that's really a bad idea. Low density polyethylene is relatively soft and it's really a light duty material, very good for an inner jacket. My opinion should not be used for an outer jacket. So if you have spans over 300 feet and it's got an L uh, limited, uh, excuse me, a low density polyethylene jacket on it, you absolutely need to talk with both the cable supplier and the dead end supplier to come up with a working solution because I don't have one for you. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Uh, again, not a critical crossing span, right? If, if these conditions up here are met and it's a critical crossing span, you should really upgrade to a medium tense, dense, excuse me, medium duty dead end. The medium duty dead end. So the cable everyday tension less than 2000 pounds, the MRDT less than 4000 pounds, Again, medium density or high density outer jacket. And if it's a tracking resistant jacket, this is okay if it's approved by both the cable and the dead end manufacturers. And medium duty dead ends are okay for critical crossings too, in my opinion. Uh, heavy duty, so uh, cable everyday tension, no ice or wind, greater than 2,000 pounds, 
the MRDT above 4,000 pounds. Again, medium density or high density tracking resistant is okay if, if approved by both and also okay for critical crossing spans. In some situations, a heavy duty dead end is going to be a, a special design. You know, you're you're into unusual territory if you're in these conditions. And on this slide, I did treat tracking resistant as its own category, but that's not really necessary. It tends to be either medium or heavy in reality. So let's give an example to illustrate all this, because I think it'll make more sense if you see it. So uh, here's a typical uh, ADSS cable data sheet, and it's telling you here, outer jacket is made of medium density polyethylene, because remember that material is important. And you find here maximum rated design tension. A lot of other suppliers would use that MRCL term, but again, they're synonymous. They mean the same thing, uh, in, especially in this, or in particular in this context. So for this cable, the maximum rated design tension is 1,574 pounds. Now, here's an excerpt from a typical ADSS dead end cut sheet. So this limited tension dead end is good for 2,500 pounds maximum loaded tension. So we look at it, the cable's rating 1,500. That's less than what the dead end is rated for here. So assuming this is not a critical crossing span, this limited tension dead end is OK. So the second step that you have to do is look at the cable diameter. So from that cable supplier's data sheet, 0 0.516 inches. On the manufacturer's, the dead end manufacturer's data sheet, you find here's the range that includes the cable diameter. And so you found the correct catalog number is right here. Once you know how to do it, it's easy peasy, right? So uh, moving on, next up we have supports, which you see on the left versus suspensions. And the big difference is that a support is fixed at the, at the structure, whereas suspensions are, are, as the name implies, suspended. So they're attached to something and they have the ability to move a little bit. So um, you'll see that I prefer the suspensions because that little bit of movement greatly relieves any tension and balance. So I really like them for every span, but I strongly recommend them for anything over 300 feet and any kind of critical crossing. So what I mean by that is if on this side of, of this uh, suspension, if this span is 1,000 feet and this span on the right is 100 feet, you've got a big span difference, which means you have more loading coming on this side, if nothing else, just the vertical load of the cable itself. But under wind and ice conditions, the tension and balance between the two would get even greater. And it only takes a little bit of movement to equalize that tension. But when you have a support and the support is fixed to the structure, it's the cable itself has to endure that. There's It, it won't move. So the, the cable puts up with the tension and balance. There's nothing good that can happen from that and there's bad things that can happen. So I suggest that you limit them to less than 300 feet or less. Um, another thing too is it's become really popular to say, if you take the inserts out of these, that you can pull your cable through it. And as a cable supplier, I don't like that either. I would just use a, a distribution class stringing block I just don't think it's a good idea to drag your cable through a support. Do you? 
Uh, if you choose to do that, I really think you should check with the cable manufacturer and make sure that they're okay with that. Because even a lousy distribution block uh, um, with a small roller and a small contact surface is still going to be dragging the cable less than trying to drag it through the entire length of a support like this or even this one. I. Like I say, I just don't think it's a great idea. On those support clamps, you have two options. As you saw in the picture there, you've got urethane, as you see up here, and uh, aluminum. Um, they're both OK. If you're choosing to use these, uh, you just need to look at the details. Spans generally uh, for the plastic ones are limited to at most 300 feet. Um, for the light version, you can find a, a sturdier version that gets you up to 600 feet. You do need to check the vertical load, especially under any anticipated ice conditions. And you need to notice that for both of these, your horizontal line angle change is limited to 20 degrees. And then in both cases, you're attaching with a bolt or in this one, you've actually got a banding slot. slot. So you could band it to a structure. Here, you would need to get an adapter to do it. The aluminum ones, 300 to 600. Again, check your vertical load. Note the horizontal line angle change. And I say horizontal, but really it's an elevation change too. So uh, I also make this comment about the bolt and the adapter that it needs to be perfectly perpendicular to the line. So let's go back here. So see how these are here. If if I mismounted this and maybe I ran my bolt through here, you can understand that the cable would come in, have to make a bend, and then go out. So you have kind of this Z shape in it. And again, nothing good can happen from that. And you can get um, stress a, uh, stress on the jacket as you make those bends. I don't like that. So for suspensions, you've got uh, two options as well. Um, just what I'll call a plain suspension like this, which might have rods or not. The rods allow you to get a greater distance and then if you're working with a tracking resistant cable, the, the rods also give you something to mount a corona coil on. So to smooth the electric field so that you don't have uh, tracking problems. Note that uh, this suspension, instead of being good for 20 degrees, you increase your horizontal or vertical uh, changes to as much as 30 degrees. And overall, I like this design. I think it's a solid design, very versatile. It gets the Mike Likes seal of approval. Your other option is an AGS style suspension. Uh, the cable goes through, you have these rubber grommets and then armor rods go over that. These are excellent. Uh, there's nothing wrong with them. In fact, in terms of support, they're arguably the best. Uh, and they can go easily long spans up to 1,200 feet and probably longer. But again, you would need to check with the cable manufacturer and the accessory supplier to work out the details. Uh, the rods here again, except a corona coil if you're working with a tracking resistant jacket and you further increase your horizontal line angle changes or elevation changes to up to 40 degrees, no problem. So. Why does why do I prefer this one? A little simpler, a little less expensive, easier to install. So it just overall, I think it's the better solution. But uh, these are excellent too. So how are you going to attach it at the pole? Well, with the support, you just would use a through bolt, as I mentioned before, maybe a banding adapter. For a suspension clamp, you can use a shield wire bracket like what you see illustrated here. You could also use a through bolt with an eye nut 
as a combination. That's what you see in this illustration that we used before. Or you can use a banding adapter. I'll show you one of those on the next slide. Um, it's really unusual for vertical load to be a concern with ADSS and a suspension clamp. It needs to be more than 5,000 pounds. If, maybe if you're using a banding adapter, you need to check that just to make sure. But um, pretty hard to get with ADSS cable to get more than 5,000 pounds vertical load on a suspension clamp. But if you think you might be close, you should check it, of course. Other connection, connection options for dead ends, the most common was that clevis eye uh, connecting uh, or a clevis eye extension link con connecting to the thimble clevis that I pointed out before. And you can use a through bolt with an eye nut that would connect, be at the structure to connect this to. For suspensions, as you saw in the pictures, it's really common to just use a, a, uh, an anchor shackle. So in fact, that's exactly what's done here. Uh, but here's that banding adapter picture that I promised to show you. So what connecting hardware do you use? Well, the big thing is to verify that whatever you want to use is going to fit with the accessory itself. Um, you also need to double check that your assembly is consistent with the orientation of the attachment point. Uh, but if you make a mistake there, like this happens sometimes on lattice towers, you know, the orientation of the attachment point isn't what you expected it to be, or you just overlooked it. Um, but you can fix it with an extra anchor shackle most of the times. Um, naturally, I would suggest you check what your company already uses, balance that against price and availability, and just whatever you like. Uh, sometimes people ask if a bolt nut cotter pin combination is better than just having a, a cotter pin in my in my experience a cotter pin alone is fine but some people like the extra security of there being a bolt in there in addition to the cotter pin excuse me a nut in addition to the cotter pin so uh, we've talked about dead ends we've talked about uh, suspensions or supports Moving on to other types of accessories. So first up, Aeolian vibration. So Aeolian vibration is not likely to cause fatigue damage on the cable itself. This is in significant contrast to any type of cable with aluminum in it, whether it's ACSR or OPGW. But ADSS does tend to vibrate at higher levels. And the jacket may not be damaged by the vibration per se, but if the vibration is causing the cable to run up, uh, to rub against something, then you can get damaged from wear. And that energy in the vibration has to go somewhere. It's conservation of energy. So it's gonna pass through to the connecting hardware or the structure itself. And so again, you can get wear on your hardware. So I consider spiral vibration dampers to be cheap insurance against problems and, and therefore suggest you always use them. Really, SVDs are the only option for ADSS. Uh, they look like what you see here. You have a large helix and a smaller helix that acts as your gripping section. You can nest them. They're uh, relatively cheap. The protection plans are easy. You see what it is here, two per span up to 800 feet, four per span up to 1,600, six up to 2,400. You can nest them, which makes them easy to install. Um, the only disadvantage are if you're working with 288 fiber cable, it could be above three quarters of an inch. Mm. Normally, you wouldn't use SVDs above three quarters of an inch. So talk to the cable supplier, talk to the accessory supplier, see what they can come up with. So uh, I, I always think it's a good idea to have both work together, and especially when it comes to coming up with 
what your vibration protection plan is going to be. Uh, I've already mentioned the, the placement guidelines is very easy. There are cases where you should maybe use more dampers, 50 to 100% more. Talk to the damper and the cable supplier and see what they think. River crossings, canyon crossings, any terrain that's very flat. So basically critical spans plus the notion of terrain that's very flat and unbroken by trees. So here in Texas, we have a lot of terrain like that. Next up, down lead clamps. So at your splice points, you're gonna to need to guide the cable down the structure to your splice enclosure. You've got two basic types, plastic, typically urethane or aluminum. Both are fine. I really have no objection to either, but uh, I tend to say use the urethane ones for ADSS um, and the metal ones for OPGW. So plastic to plastic and metal to metal. I may be being a purist there. How to mount them? Well, you've got a lot of options there. You've got a lag screw, banding adapter. We saw a picture of that before. And then if you're working with ladders, towers, there are all kinds of lattice tower adapters that are uh, available. Now, splice enclosures. There are lots of splice enclosures on the market today. As I say here, could do a separate webinar and maybe I will at some point just on splice enclosures. Uh, today's most popular type is on the left here, this dome type enclosure. Uh, you like these because the seal is at the bottom, right? So any water is flowing down and flowing, tending to flow off and away from the seal. And being at the bottom like that, the sealing distance is nice and minimized. Clamshells are an older type design, but they still are fine. But you'll notice that you have a much greater area to seal. So that does make them a little bit more vulnerable to leaking and leaking is not good. And then you have this old cast design, but some people still use them. Uh, the dome type offers the best seal and you, it prevents leaks. And water and fiber just don't mix. In contrast, uh, the cast types, uh, they tend to have the most leaks from my experience and uh, they create other problems. Um, I'll leave it at that for now. Uh, <coughs> in your splice enclosure, you gotta pick your splice trays. 24 fiber trays coordinate well uh, but their 12 fiber works too. So just use whatever you and your splice techs work. Um, cable storage, it is a good idea to coil up some extra cable. Uh, this picture actually shows uh, OPGW because I couldn't find one for ADSS, but same concept for ADSS. I prefer these coil storage brackets over what's called snowshoes. We'll mention them in passing in a moment. In certain areas, you may need bullet resistance. There are bullet resistant housings of different types that are available. Use what you like. I promised I would talk about snowshoes in passing. I just don't like them. Not on ADSS. It's a carryover from the strand and lash concept. You would have mounted snowshoes on the messenger cable, not on the cable it was supporting. Um, ADSS is supposed to support its own weight. Do you really think it's a good idea to add extra weight to it, especially when it's not necessary? How is that going to, ha what's going to happen over 10, 15, 20 years? Well, I don't know is the truth, but I can't think of anything good that can happen from doing this. And I can certainly think of a lot of things that are bad. So my recommendation to you is to please stick with coil storage brackets like you see here. Just my opinion. So we'll close out with a quick uh, recap. So dead ends, uh, I suggest the formed wire type. Be sure to check your correct rating. 
suspension. Uh, use use what you like. I'm not sure what I meant here. Not that other type. Oh, okay. Now I understand what I what I meant. Had in mind. So, I'm saying use suspensions. Don't use supports. <laughs> uh, connecting hardware. Whatever you want to use, but do check that the fit and the orientation are correct. Uh, SVDs, as I said, cheap insurance. I would use them. Uh, for down lead clamps, I mildly prefer the plastic type. For splice enclosures, I do very much prefer today's dome type design, but you know, whatever you like. And cable storage, please stick with coil storage brackets. So. Uh, thanks. I think I went a little bit fast today, but that's okay. That just leaves us more time for questions. So we'll open up the floor. What's on your mind? Uh, let, me, let me stop this. And uh, you can either ask questions via the chat or I think we can unmute you and then you can ask your question that way. Okay, so any questions in the chat? Okay, any, uh, if not, I think we're done for today. What I'll do is I'll close out then with some comments about uh, how to get those credits and the follow-up. So uh, after everybody who participated today, you'll receive a follow-up email from us. Um, there'll be a link in there where you can get the slides if you want, and you can find the video recording of this. So you'll have that video later. So you know, it's Friday night and you can't find something on Netflix that you're interested in. Well, you know, you've got this recording that you can fall back on. Uh, you can show it to friends and family and impress them of your knowledge of ADSS accessories. Uh, there will also be a link to a survey. Please give us feedback and we're always open to ideas for topics that we should be covering because they're of interest to you because if it's of interest to you then it's of interest to us so please feel free to share uh, that and let's see i do uh, see a comment in here uh, in sp uh, well thank you for the kind comments by the way uh in span splicing from tufik hi tufik it's good to hear from you uh, I, like the snowshoe solution could be used for um, in-span splicing of ADSS, and I would never do that. Okay. I mean, even on even on my schematic, I showed that. Yeah, just to just to hear it that it's not recommended. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. You know, I I should l literally add that here. Let's go back for to educate everybody. Do, 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 do. That was at the very beginning. That would be doing something like that. So for me, this is double bad. You're you're using a <laughs> snowshoe, plus you're hanging a splice enclosure on your cable. Really? <laughs> I mean, sorry. Just go to the structure. Do it there, please. Yeah. <laughs> so. Yes. so a uh, question here, how do accessories affect SAG? Uh, the accessories, them. oh, okay, yeah. SVDs, so spiral vibration dampers, and, um, uh, you know, I didn't talk about the airflow, airflow spoilers, so an, an anti-galloping device that's available. Those would add cable, excuse me, add weight to the cable. So you would need to factor that extra weight in when you're doing your sag and tension calculations. So if you're using like PLS CAD or uh, Southwire's SAG-10, um, they have a way of factoring in extra weight on the cable. You could use that. 
if you're using uh, if you're not using those, then you would have to get either SAG intention data from a supplier, in which case you should tell them that you plan to use those, what you plan to use, and then they should be able to factor that into it. And then we have an online tool for doing SAG intention calculations. And it just occurs to me that I don't know that we included adding extra weight as an option. So I'll have to look into that. I've got to make myself a note about that. The way the way you would do it if you used our online tool is you would calculate the uh, the weight of what you're planning to add, and then just manually add that to the cable's unit weight. That would be the way I would work around that. Uh, yeah, that would work might be cumbersome if you have a wide range of spans to do because you'd have to do it for each individual span because it's going to change, but that would be a way to do it. Uh, somebody laughing at one of my corny dad jokes. Thank you. For long spans requiring more than two spiral vibration dampers, is it better to nest the dampers or to place them consecutively next to each other? I, I would nest them only for ease of installation. They're equally effective whether you did it um, either way. But I, I would I would do that. Someone likes my Mike's likes. <laughs> Thanks. Just, you know, we might as well make things a little bit interesting and entertaining, don't you think? So, okay. What about uh, Corona rings? Uh, Mustafa. Well, um, I, when you've asked the question that generally, I, I, I don't know how to respond. Um, if, if you're installing uh, OPGW, OPGW, if you're installing ADSS on a high electric field and you need a tracking resistant jacket, then you also need Corona, corona coils. Oh, as opposed to a Corona ring. Yeah, I call them Corona coils. That's really, I think that may be preform line product specific term for it, but there are others out there. And and um, yeah, a Corona coil would be fine uh, rather than a Corona, uh, I'm sorry, a Corona ring would be fine rather than PLP's Corona coil. I, I don't mean to be too, um, uh, yeah, Corona rings are normally designed for um, to go at the end of insulator strings, and they're made out of aluminum. So I, I would prefer preform line product solution. Uh, I don't think I thought to include a picture in here. So that's another improvement I need to make in the future to this presentation. Um, I do in, I have a separate webinar on ADSS and high electric fields, and I do have a picture in there. And if you look on our website, you can find that topic and you can watch that or Alexis, do we post the slide, the link to the slides there too? Yes. Yeah. So you can find the slide there. Uh, well, what the heck? Uh, okay, for everyone else, I don't want to keep you. I will go ahead and look at it, uh, or I'll just close out if, if you want to go ahead and move on to other things for today. I'll go find that picture of what we're talking about now, just so it's more clear what we're talking about. Um, but otherwise, you know, you can hang around if there are more questions. I'll continue to take questions as long as there are questions. Otherwise, you can go about your business, enjoy your day. Do look for that uh, email with uh, the links that I talked about. And I will mention something that next month in March, the topic for March is we're going to talk about the loose tube concept because throughout several of these webinars, I've talked about the loose tube and how it works, but not in detail, number one. And number two, 
I've never explained what the alternatives are. What's the other way of doing it if you weren't doing loose tube? And so next month I'm going to tackle that topic. So look look for that. So just give me a moment uh, to find. Do, 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 do. Oh, and then I forgot to say, thanks for your participation today. Appreciate people coming out. So, yeah, so it's called ADSS and High Electric Fields. And it's loading now. So let's share that screen. So you should be seeing ADSS in high electric field. So bear with me. We'll scroll through this. So what we're talking about, this is a Corona coil. And as we mentioned, it's installed at the end of the insulator strings to grade the electric field in this general area. This happens to be a picture of a Corona coil that's not working very well. <laughs> you should, it's supposed to prevent the Corona that you see here. And then these are, dang, I said, I keep confusing the terminology. These are Corona rings. These are PLP's Corona coils. So they're yes. kind of like, they start off as an SVD type grip, and then they, they wide out, or they get much wider than an SVD. In fact, you can see the SVD, there's an SVD installed on this cable too. So this is a Corona coil, works great. There are other designs. This is PLP's specific one. Um, you know, use what you like, but again, rely upon talking to your cable manufacturer and your accessory supplier to make sure that the two work together. That, that's all I can tell you, or that would be my, my best advice to you. Uh, yeah, some suppliers use the rings use something more like this. I have seen a design where it, it kind of, it's more like a two halves that bolt on over the over your ADSS um, and act as a more like a Corona ring. Then so they work a little, little bit different, look different, but they do the same function. It's It's fine with me. For FAT, for factory acceptance tests, tensile tests need to be done with the compatible tension set. Yeah, I, I do not object to having a, a cable supplier and an accessory supplier actually go do a test on the dead end uh, to verify that they work properly. Now, I'll tell you, with, in the ADSS world, it's really rare for people to do that but it's uh, actually a good practice um, if people would do that more. Yeah, because that way you know and there's no finger pointing if there's a problem later. But, but I don't see that done very often. Okay. Well, uh, any other questions? Do, 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 do. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate everybody's time and attention. I appreciate the questions because, you know, a little bit of interaction makes it more interesting. And uh, thanks again for your time. And 
look for the follow-up email. Please give us feedback. Uh, take the test and get your continuing education credits and enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye.